I mentioned again uh, what I we reported at last our last meeting two weeks ago that people are still able to submit nominations for the Roy London Humanitarian Award and the John Cronin Public Service Award. Um, so if you have any questions regarding either of those, you can contact Christine McCarthy in the Selectman's Office. Uh, we'll take some agenda items out of order uh, while we wait for some of our guests to arrive for the meeting. And Todd Corchin, our DPW director, is here uh, to talk about some ideas that are being put forth um, for Route 109. And so just a little bit of background, uh, MassDOT and the Central Transportation Planning staff are looking at uh, ways to improve some traffic flows in key areas and happen to have had a study done that focused on Westwood's Route 109. So uh, Howard Stein Hudson, HSH, one in a, an engineering firm has done some work to come up with some proposals on work that they think maybe can be done on Route 109. So. Are you with us, Todd? I know oh, you're okay. tired. You've been a busy guy. Um, My eyes are pinned open right now. Okay. So that if I stop mumbling or get off topic, let me know. We'll move on to something um, else. That's yeah. correct. The, um, the engineering firm that, that did the work um, for MassStar was Howard Stein Hudson. Uh, they came in probably about a month and a half ago and met with Mike and I and Brendan. And they came up with just some low-cost suggestions along the Route 109 corridor. Um, Basically, the gist of it is they want to tweak some of the timing and make adjustments to accommodate the secondary roads, having easier access onto Route 109, and also having more of a steady flow along Route 109. Um, within the packet, we defined some of their suggestions or laid them out. Um, the intersections that they were concerned with and, sugge and suggested some of the improvements were um, obviously all along Route 109 at Hartford Street, at Gay Street, Windsor Road, Barlow Lane, and Summer Street. And some of their suggestions are updates to all the red clearance intervals. Um, basically what they're suggesting is changing the interval timing between the yellow sequencing hitting to the red sequencing from one second and make that two seconds. Um, so basically, you know, you're driving down Route 109 in layman's terms, you have one second to go through a yellow light. They're suggesting that they increase that to two seconds. They're also saying that we should probably consider reducing the walk time. Um, reducing the walk time. It's currently six seconds on a pedestrian walk crosswalk. They're suggesting that we reduce that to four seconds. Also reallocating some more green time to the side streets, i.e. Um, Barlow Lane and Windsor Road. I know in the past, Mike probably has more history on this than I do, but in the past, the residents have inquired if there's anything the town could do to provide more of a exit point coming off of Barlow and Windsor, getting on to Route 109. Um, and by providing them some more green time, I think that addresses a little bit of their concerns. Mike, on the flip side of that, I actually brought up to Howard Stein and said, well, if you're increasing that, how does that then affect? Right. But everything else apparently coincides as far as the reduction or the increase actually in the yellow time and they gave this whole mathematical explanation and equation and said that it all jives together between the crosswalk time that you're reducing the yellow sequencing that you're increasing so it has to be a package it has to be a package but, but I mean, todd in the morning i i commute in the morning the evening on 109 no one's using the crosswalk lights mm -hmm. they're not used totally so agree. They've factored that into somehow improving. It, it, it's not used now. Mm -hmm. So whether it's six seconds, ten seconds, or four seconds right. is irrelevant. Right. Reallocating more time to the side roads mm -hmm. is going <coughs> to incentivize more people to cut through the neighborhoods. We have got to make the greens on 109 longer. Mm -hmm. well, the, the, two, the two reallocations that they're talking about are Barlow and Windsor, mm -hmm. and there's no access they're to generous. use those as cut throughs. Okay. So those are the only two. They're not talking about increasing Summer Street or yeah, the other. Uh, it's it's simply just to satisfy the desire. But can we, the can we get the, the green at summer longer? Did, when you get on the way home at night, you sit on 109, on 128, and when you finally get through the green there, there's so much running room. Mm -hmm. 
if you would allow that green to be longer, you'd alleviate so much traffic coming off 128. Right. The same is true in the morning. Once you get through the green at summer, you have plenty of running room. But because there's so many people coming out of those side roads who have been cutting through the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. the traffic gets no momentum. It, so yeah, you're right. it, it, it's like it's awful. You so. sit and you sit and you sit. And what we continue to do is we incentivize people to cut through. And we've got to prioritize the flow on 109. Well, when we had met with them, keep in mind that these are all low-cost improvements. It was a general study that MassDOT proposed and funded and had this company come in. So it wasn't anything extensive that they, I mean, it was extensive to some degree, um, but within the conversation that we had in the discussion, it, it kind of got sidetracked, but in a good way. And we started talking about the technology that's offered now nowadays. Um, and basically it went down the road of the communication and none of our signals communicate with one another. Mm -hmm. This technology now is far more advanced than when the town, I believe the town researched this a while back. It, was, it wasn't as advanced and it was far more expensive than what it is now. Um, I had actually, since Howard Stein Hudson conducted this study, and I fig figured in good faith at least allow them the opportunity to do some research on behalf of the town of Westwood and see what the costs perhaps would be if there are funding opportunities that the state would offer <coughs> the program, you know, the clean emissions, I forget the actual, yeah, the, yeah, the, the act that's there, it's a CO, they, they would refer to it within the same, yeah, re geos. exactly, and they said that there's probably money that they're exploring that as a potential, so basically <coughs> what we would have is a, is a traffic signal system that would talk to one another mm -hmm. and they can do it at intervals of 30 seconds, 45 seconds, or 60 seconds where the light at Gay Street speaks to the light at, at Summer Street and the light at Hartford Street and it says, you know, there's no one here right now, let's keep the green flow going. That's yeah. ultimately what we need. This for this recommendation <laughs> here is very, it's very sim much simplified. It's not to that degree, but I think it, it experiments a little bit and says, is this working, is it not? Yeah. If it isn't, it's basically on a trial basis. If it isn't working or it doesn't do anything to alleviate anything, <coughs> I think inevitably my goal would be to pursue the communication end of things. Yeah, no, I guess my, my one of the low cost items that the communication, communication no, no, I mean, no. I mean it can be, be I, right, have them. I guess that's my question is, oh, what's the next evolution? Like what, what are we doing to really deal with the now, bigger well, issues? That's important improvement that I think that they were suggesting was the one at Summer Street, mm -hmm. which was to put a double barrel uh, left-hand turning lane at mm -hmm. Summer Street. Now it's a one lane turn, mm -hmm. left-hand turn. This is to take two lanes and make them turn so you can reduce the amount of time that you have, need to have a green on Summer Street because you get two lanes of traffic going left in order to uh, maximize the amount of time that you can keep green on High Street. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I, I think this is great, but I, I think this is a drop in the bucket of what we need. I think they even agree to that. They agreed. I mean, really, that's that's where the conversation went. I mean, that's why it got driven towards, well, what can we do long term? Because this obviously isn't a permanent solution or a de solution by any means. I think the solution is to look into this advanced technology that we desperately need along this corridor because you're not going to resolve it with painting arrows and right. tweaking timings you couldn't well, prove it you're i mean not solve it though what jumped out at me when i was reading it was how much time they spent on the crosswalk signals right. no one's even using them in the morning right. I, you know that became a point of focus for them right. they, they're the not the even used only go on if somebody push pushes the button. the button right right but to john's point at seven o'clock in the morning there's no one the button you're it, not gonna get any benefit right, right. so they, they they kind of factored in this decrease in the crosswalk time no one's using them now like it right. so i don't know but they don't go on unless you press right yeah. Uh, Other times of the day, though, right. th th they are long. And what happens is people get a break in the traffic and walk. Mm. And then the walk signal goes on and it stops right. everything. There's the person who needed it has long since crossed the road. So how do we start that, that bigger piece? Like, what do we need to it's do? Already the, it's already, it's already a motion. Oh, okay. In fact, I, I spoke to um, Alexander, who played a big part. I can't think of her last name. She played a big part in the study, the overall study. And she had actually met with Mike and I. Um, and I spoke to her last week and said the town of Westwood is very much interested in pursuing this. I'm, I'm interested in pursuing it, obviously, to mm -hmm. see what type of money we can have yeah. funded for us. And, you know, I'm looking to try to get as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Hopefully 80% of it would be my goal. So 
But that said, we want to make sure that it's the technology we want. It's similar to what the streetlight program. You, you right. want to do something, you want to do it the right way. You don't want to experiment with. Well, I think this is great, but I just think there's so much So, water. come the spring? Yeah. Once the snow's gone? Yeah, when are they going to stop implementing well, As far as the work here, yeah. I mean, you want to do it in the spring. You obviously don't want to do it in the summer when the traffic becomes yeah. a quarter of okay. what it is now. But yeah, it, this would be a sp early springtime project. All right, well. Thank you. There's some feedback. Get to the uh, next step as soon as you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, and before you go and before we get on to other things, we've got the request to post and fill the uh, heavy equipment operator position. That's correct. So we've got a retirement, a rather significant retirement. John Stanovich retiring after 47 years 47 of service. Years, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I think it'd be great, Mike, if the Board of Selectmen sent him a letter thanking him for his outstanding service over that long period of time. Yeah. And uh, so you're just looking to fill the position as is? As a heavy equipment operator. So what we're looking to do is promote internally. Mm -hmm. It's a, a senior foreman position within the existing staff and then replace John's position license-wise as a heavy equipment operator. That would be his... Any questions? No. Motion? So I move that we authorize the Director of Public Works, Human Resources Director, and the Town Administrator to post and fill the senior foreman position, and assuming that it will be an internal promotion, to then authorize the Director of Public Works, Human Resources Director, and Town Administrator to post and fill the heavy equipment operator position within the Department of Public Works. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, none. Okay, so that's good. Go home and get some rest. Oh, before you go, thank you to you, all your crews, everybody for doing an outstanding job and getting the roads all cleared by very early this morning and the parking lots and everything. That yeah. was outstanding. Uh, and I see the sidewalks have been cleared over the course most, of the day. Yeah, most of the sidewalks will be cleared. Uh, the remainder of the sidewalks, we have some stretches along University Ave on Pond Street and a little bit on 109 that will be finished up tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. The Just roads were great, though. Yeah. The, crew, yeah. the crews did a fantastic job. I think I say this every year. I mean, it starts with Brendan. He kind of orchestrates mm -hmm. the whole winter right. concert, I guess you call yeah. it. But um, the guys are fantastic, our guys in particular. And then the contractors that we use, the CJP and Sons, and they're outstanding. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the Brendan's messages about the trash collection Brendan delay. Is, Brendan is now known as Brendan the Ryan. voice of Westwood. <laughs> Westwood. The, um, the only... Uh, probably negative would be that every single day I have to listen to my kids can do, can Todd and his crew please slow down so we don't have school tomorrow uh, well, <laughs> my wife wants me to speed up so she's not stuck at home the guys have done a great job so right. thank you thank you thanks Todd, thanks, All right, Todd. Todd. thank you hopefully uh, get a break in this all right um, now we have our guests here for tonight we have a special occasion uh, so there's a lot of important news that came out of the state house at year end uh, by way of background this is pertaining to the aid to the elderly home rule petition so we have had the aid to the elderly and disabled taxation fund in place for who knows how many years long time <laughs> since 1999 this fund has heretofore been solely funded with private donations from people in the community and we've been told that in recent years it's about forty thousand dollars a year is raised and last year under uh, Mr. Gillette's leadership and Mr. Hearn's leadership on the Board of Selectmen there was an initiative to seek a home rule petition approval at the State House so that the town could allocate general funds to this account and expand what we're able to do for the elderly and disabled folks in town who benefit from this uh, very important account. And we have here our state representative, Paul McMurtry, and our state senator, Michael Rush, because of their leadership at the State House. Not only did it get carried through the State House, but it came out signed by the governor at the end of 2016. And so we also have people who are on the committee. We have Sharon Papetti here, Pam Dukeman. Uh, let me give the names of the other people who serve on this committee. Lena uh, Arena DeRosa, our 
COA Director Pat Conley, Leo Crow, Jim Gavin, Josepha Jowdy, Janice Polin, Debbie Robbins, Al Wizialko, Michael Walsh, Pat Ahern. And I wanted you all to come in tonight so we could hold this up as demonstration of town government and state government working together in a very positive and productive way. And the, the people who most need us in the community are going to be the beneficiaries of this work. Uh, so I would like to open it up. I guess I'll start with you, Mr. Ahern, if you'd like to make any comments. Well, I want to congratulate these two gentlemen that I'm sitting next to on their leadership at the State House for getting this bill through so quickly. Home rule petitions, as we very well know, mm -hmm. uh, we don't always seem to move them that quickly, but these guys uh, move these at warp speed, and uh, the uh, people who are elderly and infirmed in Westwood uh, should be grateful for your leadership uh, in moving this through quickly. I know that the members of the committee are grateful, and uh, uh, we become a better town for that. So uh, thank you. Mr. McMurtry. I, look, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, Madam Chair, Mr. Hickey, Mr. Walsh. Uh, certainly what Senator Rush and I did only compliments uh, the work of everyone sitting behind us and um, you and your leadership. But anytime we can uh, work alongside of you and uh, by, side, by your side to support those in the community that uh, are deserving, um, the disabled and the elderly, then it's uh, certainly... Um, gives meaning to the work that we do in public service. So there's plenty of examples of government not working, but this is an example of government working, and I'm proud to partner with Senator Rush and uh, work on your behalf and all the citizens in the town. And uh, I, I think what happened here in Westwood is going to be another amazing example for Commonwealth-wide, something that we'll see uh, become adopted uh, across the state. So again, Westwood is uh, a leader um, and I will just say in closing, uh, one of my favorite quotes is that of Hubert Humphrey, and to paraphrase it, it's uh, the moral test of government is um, how the government treats those in the dawn of life, our children, and the uh, dusk of life, our elderly, and the shadows of life, our disabled. So certainly this legislation and the work that you did here in uh, Westwood epitomizes that. So I'm really pleased and appreciate the uh, very kind gesture to invite us and be in Mr. Hearn's company and those on the committee for uh, this uh, pleasant evening. Thank you. Senator Rush. Thank you, Madam Chair and Selectman Hickey, Selectman Walsh, uh, Mr. Gillette. It's an honor to be here. Um, th these are the very best examples of government. And uh, Representative McMurtry and I get to go to the State House each and every day. And uh, we just love the fact that we get to represent a town that is so well run, uh, that is so engaged, uh, whose leaders are listening. Uh, to the citizens and then making decisions based on what they're hearing. Um, so this is the perfect example of collaboration. I know that Selectman Ahern had worked on this for many, many years. This is something he's very, very concerned about. And you put together this outstanding committee, worked so hard tirelessly, many, many hours with a great vision to make this community even better. As Representative McMurtry uh, mentioned, there are colleagues of ours from other parts of the state who are very interested mm -hmm. in what's going on here in Westwood. Many, many issues, but this in particular. So uh, it is truly uh, great to be with all of you this evening, and uh, we, we are grateful and, and humbled by, by it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, again, thank you to you both. And Pat is such a driving force on any issue. Uh, that he gets behind. We we are fortunate in Westwood, and I tell people that all the time. We we um, benefit from decades and generations worth of good decisions, mm -hmm. and I think this is just part of that tradition. Uh, we enjoy a great quality of life in Westwood. Our elite school system. We have a member of our school committee here this evening. I want to thank them for their leadership as well. The schools continue to draw people to Westwood. People remain in Westwood for many years because of a great quality of life, and those that wish to remain. Mm -hmm. For the rest of their lives, we want to support them and we want them to stay. They're an integral part of our town, part of our culture and our community. And so this really is a tool that allows that and really adds to the vibrancy of our, of our civic life. So we appreciate all the work that you did and Pat, thanks for taking it on and driving it. Mr. Walsh. Yes, so Mr. McMurtry, I have more of a story than you really know. So uh, when, when this passed, I called Mr. Hearn. I also called Eddie Germano. And you may recall Mr. Germano 
called your office and your office worked with them and sent them every bill that had been filed last time. So Mr. Germano called me and said, what can you do with this? I talked to uh, Mike Gillette, and I gave him a copy of every single bill. And based on those, we were able to come up with what we wanted, working with the legislatures and the council for both houses, both the House and the Senate, to be able to get this done. So your work behind the scenes to Mr. Germano gave Mr. Gillette the right language that we needed to work with to get it through. So behind the scenes, it's a lot of things that you know took place, whether or not you know it, but Mr. Germano was uh, one of the people who wanted it. He said he doesn't need it, but he knows that there are a lot of seniors in town who do. So uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Germano for helping get it, and to uh, Mr. Hearn, who has been driving this since day one. So I'm glad we were finally able to get it. And I will be, I think, the newest member on the committee since uh, Mr. Hearn has retired from our uh, chair area up here. So uh, I'm happy to be a part of it. And I know uh, the seniors in town really do appreciate every bit that we can do for them. So uh, I'm sure you guys all know that. So thank you. And a public service announcement. We are welcoming ongoing donations to this fund. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's the people in the community who have allowed this to be successful. And uh, what we're hoping is to augment that and expand what we do uh, and make sure that it's sustainable. So that's where this um, home rule petition comes in, that we now have the ability to do that. And um, we have some ideas, and we'll probably look to doing the first funding towards it uh, this fall after the committee can report back as to what they think the capacity is, um, the need out there in the community. So you've given us a tool in our toolbox to help people and how fortunate everybody is. So I want to thank you for coming in tonight. Thank you, Sharon, for serving on the committee. Thank you, Pam, and to all the other committee members. This is great work. Excellent. And uh, wish we could just leave it there, but we have other business we need to do. So thank you for- I'll excuse myself. I've seen you, that you other all <laughs> Oh, You're welcome on, to stay. <laughs> anyway, good to see you all. Thank, thank you for coming by. Thank thank you. You. See you guys. Thank okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Dukeman, <laughs> we are back to the budget. Other aspects yeah. of the budget. Um, we missed you at our last meeting. Glad to know you're feeling better. Yes, it's thank a you. wonderful time of year, and the winter could end soon, and we'd all be very happy. Yes. Um, so anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know there are some small items to go through, and then maybe a general update on some things and what you decide what you need us to update up, be updated sure. on. Sure. Uh, so one of the small items is just you've been doing any transfers we need to keep up with the FY18 budget during the year, and we just have. Um, a couple of small ones for you to do, uh, just a total of $12,900, uh, just transfers for um, things that occurred uh, in departments uh, with salaries. A position was upgraded, we had a maternity leave coverage in one department. Um, so outline at the bottom of your proposed action to transfer 12943 from your Selectman's Reserve account to uh, the Board of Selectman's Salary account, a Veterans Affairs Salary, Youth and Family Services, and the housing zoning budget. So again, just small items that keep us up to date with the budget. Any questions regarding these? Motion? No, pretty, it was pretty straightforward. Um, I move that we approve the $12,943 from the Selectman's Reserve account uh, to the following accounts, the Board of Selectman salary, Veterans Affairs salary, Youth and Family Services, and the housing and zoning. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Any other update you want to give us at sure. this point? Uh, I just have to mention on the current year budget, um, we will at your next meeting have to deal with the snow and ice. These I'm storms sure you will. have uh, now put us over our allocation. So yes. we will be back in and Todd will get some of that detailed information and we'll be back in to get you to authorize, um, you know, kind of an upper spending level. Yeah, and, uh, and even now, I mean, it, it's not snowing out, but the wind is so bad, like half the roads are being covered yeah. with snow all over again. So. Yeah, their work doesn't end. Yes. Just with the so. storm being done. Yep. I think we were lucky that this morning was <coughs> worse, but... Yeah. And remember what happened when we were at the last meeting and you jinxed us by saying... <laughs> I'm sure it was all my fault. 
Yeah, Mother Nature and I are like this. <laughs> Uh, and then just very quick update on the 18 budget, just we like to uh, fill you in on what we've done since the last meeting. And so one thing we did is we did produce the FY18 municipal proposed budget. So we sent that out to everyone. It's also on the town website, so everyone can take a look at that. Uh, the other item we'll get out the door this week is the FY18 summary budget, uh, which incorporates kind of all of our revenue projections and all of that detail for people to look at. Uh, we're just finishing that up, and then that will be out, and that'll be on the website uh, but everything that's in there uh, whip it out to all of our groups and all of our committees doing lots of presentations so everyone kind of knows where we are with the numbers but like with our other documents we like to kind of at this point in time print it get it out so people can take a look through so that'll go through you know tax revenue and state aid and tax bills that type of thing uh, and then since your last meeting we've been back in again with a couple of uh, committees we've been into the Finance Commission um, presenting them this municipal book as well as updating them and so Mike was able to go through everything with them and make sure that they know you know where the selectmen are with the budget what are the pieces that are done now and what's going forward uh, so he went through a long presentation with them um, and the FinCom now will start to kind of you know review the budget and and meet with some of the larger departments and that type of thing um, and as you mentioned, also the long range met again and continued work on the capital budget. Uh, and really, that's what we'll have for you at your next meeting at the end of February is to come back and kind of start really refining those capital budget articles yeah. so that you can see that, uh, see what we're able to do for 18 and what you might want to put forth for the capital articles uh, to go forth to the FinCom uh, in, in early March. Um, off topic, but we usually get the school budget sent to us, the budget document. Have they sent you extras? Um, they didn't send an extra, but we can certainly send that out. Um, can you ask them? Do you want a PDF or a hard copy or? PDF. PDF, I guess is fine. Yeah, don't feel free. Sure, I, I can send that out. Okay, and we have information um, that you had sent us regarding, or reminder more than anything, we had it before, on the police and fire salary line items and overtime and a recommendation on how we'll handle that. Um, I know we've shared with the Finance Commission the expectation that we'll treat that like we did for FY15 where we will have a, a separate um, grouping for those new positions in police and fire and have it approved subject to future approval by the Board of Selectmen before they're actually funded so we can look at the timing it's not the question of whether or not we'll add positions. It's really more the timing of that. Yes, end. but again, exactly as we did in FY15 when we added that first round of additional police and fire related to University Station. So we've set aside funding, clearly marked it for public safety, put the notation that nothing can go forward without the Board of Selectmen uh, review and approval and release of the funds. Uh, so I know the Selectmen will continue to look at uh, what is the right timing for that? But this sets the money aside, gets it into the budget process so that those positions can go forward during FY18. Okay. Question? Yeah. So, Pam, I, I know when I was reading that, I, just, I, I know that the, bal <coughs> the balance of the BOS reserve fund was down. How does that get replenished? Is that voted on a town meeting that we put in a Board of Selectmen Reserve account? How does that... So Fine. that's an account, uh, just like any other budget, that you have uh, a certain amount for the year. Okay. That's 225000 okay. So that would start again on new July 1 I for see. FY18. Okay. So we've been using that to kind of make transfers uh, during the year as, as small adjustments occur. Uh, and now as we come to town meeting, those first couple of articles at town meeting, Article right. 1 and 2, we'll do any other transfers that we also need, okay. like to handle the snow and ice um, and if there are any other items um, that come up. Okay. Uh, so a lot of the small items you've you've handled during the year, and then we'd just be looking at if there was anything else that we needed to do at town meeting. Okay. But then that account is uh, starts anew I see. in okay. July one. Thank you. Uh, do you see any issues looming? That it's really not. 
that complicated a budget year right now. Yes, and we've kind of been talking about that when we've met with groups. You know, we're coming off of, you know, two or three very, very busy, complicated, active budget years. Uh, and this is just not one of them. We kind of operate at that level all the time. Okay. It's a little bit more of a settling in year. Um, and you're seeing that, you know, in the municipal budget request, the school budget request, uh, our overall activity. Uh, it's, a, it's a quieter year. We seem to be in good shape. Uh, it's still, you know, a tight budget year that we have to still make choices about what's going forward, uh, particularly how much capital we can do, that type of thing. But it's certainly uh, a quieter year than we've had the last couple of years. I think a lot of people got used to that that's how, you know, the budgets mm -hmm. are all the time, and it's really not. You know, usually... You, you know, once in a while you have some issues. We had a lot the last couple of years because of a lot of the changes that were going on in town and uh, with University Station and with from some of the right. funding from there, we've been able to do a lot. Uh, so this is much more of a settling in year uh, for FY18. Good. One more question, if I yes. may. So I think the last item we're waiting on that we may have at your next meeting or in the early meeting in March would be the health insurance budget, yeah. uh, waiting to see what the uh, state uh, settles up with that. So that would be kind of one of the only items remaining to get some data back to you on that and what that means for the budget. So, Pam, when I was looking through, I was noticing that um, the police overtime was over budget. Are we able to decide how much of that is because of University Station, if any? I mean, are we able to kind of... Do they, does the police department keep statistics as to how much of it is usually for University Station versus yep. the rest of the town? They're working on that now, okay. uh, particularly to adjust that funding for FY18. So they're looking to get some data, uh, police and fire, and work with Mike and, you know, give a good update on there were the pre-studies done on what was the expectation for uh, University Station uh, activity and to take a look now and say, well, what has it been? Uh, like to try to piece that out a bit. Yeah, I'm just wondering is uh, how much of it is you know allocated for. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? That's nope. it. Okay, thanks. Pam. Thank, thank you. you I'm all set. Okay. Thanks, Pam. Yep. Appreciate thank you. it. Okay. Uh, next up, Nora. Thank you for joining us again tonight. We have our next agenda item is a discussion of oh, sure. two of the petitioner articles. Um, that relate to the FMUOD districts in Islington and on High Street. And uh, as a result of these articles being put forth, there are some um, actions that the Board of Selectmen needs to consider uh, that any property owner um, potentially impacted should those articles pass has the right to do in advance of any passage. We don't know if they'll pass. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but nonetheless, in the interim, we need to consider what action we may want to take That's as right. a property owner. So the town owns property in Islington Center. I don't believe we have, the town owns anything on the high street within the FMUOD district, but they do within the Washington Street FMUOD district. And any property owner who has property that is subject <coughs> to a zoning proposal, a proposed amendment to the zoning, has the ability to... Uh, file for a zoning freeze under Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 6. The applicant in the Islington Center area, Petruziello Properties, intends to file for a zoning freeze uh, to maintain the ability to, to develop his property under the existing zoning. I don't know if any of the other, uh, any other property owners in Islington um, along Washington Street within that FMUOD plan to do the same, nor do I know if any owners of property on High Street plan to do the same, but it, this option is available to all of them, and it's available to the town as well. So the selectmen need to consider whether they are interested in applying for a zoning freeze. If they are, what would be required would be the submission of a preliminary plan, preliminary subdivision plan, to the planning board prior to the opening of town meeting. So the deadline for that would be April 30th uh, of this year. The preliminary subdivision plan would then have to be followed by a definitive plan within seven months. If that is done and eventually approved by the planning board, then the applicant would be entitled to eight years of a freeze of the existing zoning, which mm -hmm. means for a period of eight years, you would be entitled to develop the property as you could today under the existing zoning. Um, it's, it's something that's done occasionally. Um, we have had, I believe, three zoning freezes in the past year. 
that have been put in place by applicants or or are in the process of being put in place. So it's not unusual. Uh, it's done in, in many cases throughout the state to hold on to the zoning and hold on to the investment-backed expectations mm -hmm. of the property owner. PM, other than PM. Petruzzi... Nora. Nora, I'm sorry. I'm really <laughs> tired. That's other right. than Petruziello and the town, does anybody else own any of the parcels that the Islington Square Task Force has looked at? Not the not the parcels that are part of the RFP. <coughs> so the town owns the four parcels that have been okay, offered in the issue. RFP. And Petruziello Properties owns three adjacent parcels that they are proposing for development in association with the four town-owned parcels as part of that RFP. There are other property owners throughout Islington and, and throughout High Street that own properties within FMUOD, and it would have the same opportunity if they chose to to file a, a zoning freeze. But, and I guess that was my question, though. How, how do they have notice of this impending town meeting warrant? Uh, they have the same notice that every property owner has when the FinCom sends out its notice of, oh, the, okay. of the bylaws. Other than that, we're if they're paying attention, it. right, to the to Yeah, the no, no, I mean, I know we're talking about this. It's all being right. done in public, but, but it just but seems... But no property owner receives personal notice <laughs> yeah. of a zoning change that's not a zoning change intended to just specifically change their property. It's so just interesting, though. If I, if I live out of town and I own a building along Washington mm -hmm. Street, I'm not going to get that book. And then it's effective the day after a town meeting if it's it approved. Is. Correct. So I just had this imposed on me with no notice. It just seems funny. Mm -hmm. you got to pay attention? No, no, I, I guess that's yeah. the point. But I mean, if they're watching this number one programming on that. But if they don't live in town, they don't see it. Well, they get no, notice. If you, if you if own it, the property, you got to keep up to date on the zone yeah. of the property. And, and that's lawful. And that's you do diligence. Oh, yeah. 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 It's surprising, but it is. Yeah, it just, seem, just seems odd. Well, also because they also have a... If they're property owners, but they're not voters, they may want to speak at public hearings or town right. meeting and they're get precluded. the. Well, no, they'd have to. They'd have to be recognized. If yeah. they're not residents, they'd need to be recognized. And I think. Um, it's ju it's just interesting to see that this town yeah. town meeting votes on it, and it essentially takes effect at that moment. It does. It does. So what happens if town meeting passes it? Then it goes to the attorney general's office, and so upon their approval, something. it's retroactively effective to the date of town meeting. So I, I guess, uh, just trying to sequence this a little bit. So, so Petruziello, as a matter of right, can put this freeze forward. Yes. The zoning. Any any property owner no whose one, no one land it. is subject to his, a proposed zoning amendment can do that. So we could potentially be looking at a scenario where three of the parcels have a freeze and four don't. Correct. Correct. Which, which right. really... If the, if the town does not want to freeze the zoning for the town properties, the applicant still will freeze the zoning for the properties he owns. So we will have gone down this long RFP process, got input from the whole town, and then be in a position where we're stuck. What you'd be stuck on is that the town-owned parcels, the, the four parcels that are currently owned by the town, could not be submitted in a, um, could not be considered by the planning board and granted an FMUOD approval for anything that involves residential use no. or for a project that is uh, a single project split by but the, the road. But the, con the two, two articles would affect those provisions of the bylaw. But the converse of that is we could exercise a freeze and at the end of the day opt for no residences. You absolutely could. And in fact, oh, yeah. whatever yeah. the proposal is that goes forward would still need zoning appro uh, no, town right. meeting approval right, right. in order to advance. Right. Um, so what this would do is it allows you to continue on the path you're already on with a more expeditious review right. where the project as a whole is reviewed as a whole rather than taken into parts. And if we were to do that to freeze the zoning on properties the town owns, the freeze and zoning carries with the property? It does. If and we it were to sell the properties? Correct. And it freezes the zoning bylaw as is. So it doesn't just freeze it to prevent changes that are proposed at this meeting, but it freezes it to prevent the application of any changes imposed over the next eight years. Um, upon that eighth year from the date of the definitive right, plan, so it puts it in then a the new for zoning a while. comes into place. Do you yes. have questions? You must. No, I mean, I, I think this would be like kind of 
Well, I think it's just bad to, to that we would freeze it if we're going to put it in the town meeting floor and let the voters decide that why would we want to be the ones to freeze it if the town's going to decide otherwise. I mean, I just think it's pulling the rug out from underneath the articles, which if the residents in that area come out in force and it takes a two-thirds vote. Two-thirds vote. Two-thirds right. vote. So I think for us to freeze it is kind of... Um, kind of taking it away from the residents' right to decide. But aren't we concerned, though, Michael, that all the work that's been done pursuing these options will then be dead? Not necessarily. So, so I mean, the, the only thing that's dead, John, is the housing. That's what these articles are, to take the housing out and to not be allowed to combine properties to get the number of housing. Well, right? it affects how the, how the application is processed mm -hmm. going forward. It doesn't, it doesn't um, absolutely prevent a project that we're looking at today from being approved by a town meeting vote at a later time, right. it just changes the process and makes it more cumbersome. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say also that one of the one of the um, reasons that was stated for the articles that are proposed was not just this project, but f other projects in addition to this, adding to the amount of residences right. on Washington Street and High Street. And I will also say that when I spoke to uh, I've spoken to two of the petitioners, or emailed, emailed and spoken to both of them, um, throughout the process. And I did make it clear from the very t first time we discussed a zoning amendment that a zoning freeze is a, a absolute possibility and a very likely ev event on the developer's behalf, possibly on the town's. So it, it, it's not a surprise that this would be something that would be considered. Um, and it's up to the selectmen to decide if that's the way you want to go or not. But it is uh, the the state legislature put this out as an option for a reason, mm -hmm. and it's because yeah. per people or entities own property and they own it with an investment-backed expectation of how that land can be developed. And when a zoning change is proposed, either by the town or by petitioners, it can affect that and it can um, make a difference in the value of that property. So yeah, I, I just that's for the me, case with the zone, town property as well as the private property. I mean, to just let it sit idle and miss these deadlines and go to town meeting and it doesn't pass, it's like we've lost every opportunity. No, if it doesn't pass, then, then we, there's no freeze. We don't have to. No, we no, have no, to no. The deadline it. for the freeze is before town so, meeting. So okay, the, but if it so doesn't pass. So the preliminary pass, plan would have to be filed before town meeting. Right. If the zoning amendment does not pass, the two zoning amendments don't pass. You wouldn't have to file the definitive plan, which effectuates the zoning freeze. Right. You still may want to. We still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To protect that, to get that eight-year. Correct. And, and to your point, um, Mike, when, when, I, when I look at this, I think that the zoning freeze does not obligate the town to proceed with residential. It just protects our right to make choices down the road. So... You know, the the unfortunate thing with this in terms of the timing is the discussion of the RFP hasn't made it to us yet and to the planning board and to town meeting vote to know what the town in total thinks. So we're trying to make a decision. Right. Based on incomplete information. Uh, on incomplete information for uncertain events and it, it's it's disrupting a process we put in place and the right. planning board put in place to thoughtfully look at what could be done on a in a comprehensive way to reinvest in Islington. Correct. So we had the the task force had deliberately slowed down the process for review of this proposal to not bring it to the spring town meeting in order to complete the the planning board review of a very detailed project rather than be making decisions on a concept plan. So by slowing down that process, we now do not have a full baked plan to show to town meeting for their consideration along yeah. with these articles. So the zoning freeze gives you an opportunity to develop that full baked plan so the, the town meeting voters can decide whether that's something that they want to see go forward or not. We're yeah. not talking about um, doing something that that's going 
over the town meeting voters. We're talking about continuing a thoughtful, deliberate process that's right. been spelled out publicly mm -hmm. and allowing that to go forward so that the town meeting voters can make up their mind about whether that's something they'd like to see or whether they would right. prefer not to. Right. I think what's important is to keep all the options open. I thought of that last meeting. It was great to hear that there was kind of a coalescing around a certain model. You know, the, the, really, the, the, the whole discussion had really evolved. And to, to then say, oh, that's for naught, you know, I guess I, I don't, I just don't think that's good public policy. I, I think we started a process in good faith. We've been vetting it, and we need to bring it to conclusion. But, Nora, so saying that, though, and I'm sorry, I meant to ask you this earlier. When you say the, four has ta the town has four parcels, the ICC being one. The ICC, the Wentworth Hall the uh, right. municipal lot, and oh, then there is a right. small parcel of land that's really the entrance to the driveway behind CVS, the library. CVS, that little lot CVS. there. Yes. Okay. And then the developer has three parcels of their own, the um, Cafe, Cafe Diva, Diva, the uh, Post former office. tailor shop, and the CVS property. Mm -hmm. So the former tailor shop on School Street right. is one of them, and the CVS the Crown thing. Cleaners right. parcel. Okay. So their action is their action. We have no control over right. that. We do not influence that. That's You're right. telling us they Yellow has decided. A, yes. Okay. And they have That's separate. And if you chose to file a zoning freeze jointly with them, you would submit a single plan or you could submit separate plans on your own. It would probably make more sense to file a joint plan um, because it is a subdivision plan, which means it's putting roadways uh, mm -hmm. or the the option of putting roadways mm -hmm. through the parcels so the most logical plan would involve a roadway on um, how detailed does a plan like that need to be because this sounds like it's actually generating a significant cost or could potentially be costly it could be for the definitive plan the um the, d the preliminary plan simply needs to show the outline of the right-of-way okay. and the parcels involved and some very basic information. Okay, so that doesn't have That's to be a... That's not a significant plan. It does have to be a surveyed plan, um, but it doesn't have to be... It doesn't have to have And surveys are going to occur at one time or another anyway. Correct. So that's not a... But, but the definitive plan that would have to be filed that's... within seven months would be an expensive, more detailed plan. And it needs to be because the planning board, <clears throat> upon granting approval of a definitive plan, recognizes that the roadways shown on that plan and the lots laid out on that plan could be developed at some point in the future. So we need to budget some money if we want to proceed with this, subdiv this freeze, zoning freeze, if that's what we choose to do? My understanding is that the applicant could file the preliminary plan with you as a co-applicant. And I'm not sh if you did did it together. I'm not sure there would be any cost at that right. point. No, but I'm talking for the about definitive the definitive plan. We have not discussed that, so I would think that that could be if you if the selectman makes a decision, which I would imagine they would do before that filing of a plan would be necessary. If they make a decision to go forward with the project in Islington Center, the cost of that plan could be a negotiated part of. I mean, the I'm agreement. just. I, I guess I'm just. Thinking, Tom, is this is this is this something we should have Dan kind of do lay out the options for us? I think Nora has laid out the options. For me. Well, but I guess I do, and Nora, you're great, and I rely on your expertise. <clears throat> but I, this piece about filing together or filing separately, I I would like to read something and get it, my head around that a little more. Well, you can, as Nora points out, you could either file jointly with the developer, or you could file separately on your own. Yeah, to me, filing with the developer doesn't. Okay, so you yeah. can do that. We we have we have different interests. They could become adverse at some point. You know, we don't. You know, I just very straightforward process. Okay. You file the uh, preliminary plan. That freezes the zoning. You go to town meeting. The proposed zoning articles don't pass. You don't file a definitive plan. Okay. If you go to the town meeting and the they do pass. Articles, uh, are adopted in order to get the benefit of the freeze and then have to file the definitive plan. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, so filing that preliminary is solely like a, an option hold? It is. That's exactly what it is. You said like you wanted to ask something yeah. or say something? No, I mean, if, we've, if we filed separately, then we'd have to come up with our own definitive plan and we'd probably be paying for it. 
Is that true though? Could we could we file a preliminary separately and then later file a definitive together? No. No, the 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 definitive plan effectuates the preliminary plan that's already been approved. You could file the definitive plan and not have to file the preliminary plan, but that would be going to the expense right up front right, before, right, right, before right. the end of April. I so the, the expense would be that heavy. I, I just, just personally, I, I think, you know what, if I could understand when half the planning board articles came in front, I may not vote for them if I really understood what they meant. So mm -hmm. I think I, I'm still inclined to say, and, and obviously I'm one of three, that we don't freeze it, that now that people understand what that MUOD is doing to that area, that if they can get two-thirds, then we'll have to live with it. But to kind of go back and say now, okay, and especially to file with the developer, there's already lots of rumblings about, you know, we're in cahoots with the developer already. I just think that's bad policy to for us to be, you know, file, filing joint, I think, is absolutely out of the picture. But I also think that, you know, this is going to take a mountain for them to be able to overturn it. And if they're able to overturn it and enough people come out, then so we have to live with it. I mean, I just find the planning board articles probably the most toughest articles to be able to understand. Never mind read to understand what they mean. It's, yeah. Well, I, I think the articles as they were passed were very clear what they were intended to do. And we, as also because we had done overlay districts with the university station. So it was not a new concept. And I would say, I want to exercise caution or I will counter what you said we are not in cahoots with the developer i know that we but are yeah but the way you said it might lead people to think no, but that people people are saying that even though yeah and they're going not. to and they're going to say things right but our job is to protect the interests of the town and all along the discussions with a property owner who happened to buy significant amount of the property in the area have been with an eye towards how do we do something that revitalizes or vitalizes, I don't know if it was ever a read to put in front of it, vitalizes Islington Center. We have some critical property interests there that we need to address and we're looking at how to best do it and benefit the community at the same time. So the, div the property owner who's there happens to be an entity that we need to work with. We, we are the public property owner, they are private property owner, and to maximize and do the best thing we can in Islington, they are the party we need to deal with. We didn't pick them. They bought the properties in private real estate transactions. We didn't invite them. They made a choice to buy those properties. So now we've got to, as I've said a few times already, protect our interests in the, as a town. That may, requires filing a joint preliminary plan. Correct. It doesn't mean we're in cahoots with them. It means we're looking out for our interests as a town. And we're involved in a private-public part private -public partnership, which is what the RFP envisioned in the first place, the opportunity and to combine resources for the greater good. It, yeah, I guess I'm not hearing the downside, though, of filing separately. The downside of filing separately would come in the physical plan. So if the town is filing a preliminary subdivision on the parcels it owns, they are subdividing those parcels with a road through them oh, and with you. lots okay. developed only on theirs, and the developer is doing the same thing okay. on only parcels on adjacent to them. It would be a better, m more well-coordinated plan if it was done jointly. Okay. Especially since, you know, the town and, I mean, they're, they're separated by each other. You don't, right. You don't no, no, I get it. The contiguous to town and, and so the, the benefits of the freeze are exactly the same if you file separately or jointly, but you will have a better plan if you file jointly. <clears throat> yeah, I just you know it's it's just interesting. It all goes full circle. I mean, I had said to Pat earlier, and I've always believed this that I just think generations of of leaders in Westwood have stepped up and made the right decisions. And you know, I I don't want to be driven by what people are saying or what they'll conjure up or what their thoughts are. I mean, I, I think we went into this process and, and it was a very thoughtful process. And I think that we owe it to the entire town to finalize that process. I think, you know, the people who have shown up at that Islington Square Task Force 
have done an amazing job. The, the amount of time, even you and your staff. Um, so it just doesn't feel right to say, well, we'll just put something out there that's incredibly complicated. And uh, if it botches the whole thing, it botches the whole thing. I mean, I, I, it just doesn't, I don't think that's with our tradition. Um, I think it's important to always remind people that when we talk about the town owned property, we're talking about property that was, with the exception of Wentworth Hall, at one time private property. The ICC was private property. The parking lot was a gas station. This small piece contiguous to the CVS parking lot, I'm assuming, was part of the ICC. I believe it was part of a right of way originally. Part of a right of way, but it, and it's almost meaningless land. It's 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 not developable. Um, so I, you know, I I know we talk about depossessing um, public property, which is factually correct, but it was never. We're not talking about land that has run with Westwood since its inception. This is land that was in private land, owned, land owners' hands not that long ago. And, and there was an eye when we bought the ICC of, we're going to hold it. Until such time as we can find a use to put it to, that would be, influ and the idea was, that and the gas station parking lot would influence the redevelopment of this land. Right. And also, I mean, we would be in control reason. of its fate. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because back when we bought the Islington Community Church, private property owners, private parties were interested in buying that and mm -hmm. could have redeveloped that site on its own. And we would not have the ability to have this broader conversation. Right. And that was true of the Texaco station as well. In fact, we jumped in front of a purchaser that had a development plan for that parcel, which we didn't like. And what was that, the muffler shop? That, that was a muffler shop. Oh, oh God. Uh, <laughs> and what we wanted to do is to, we needed we're the, being some proactive. land to provide for parking that we were taking away from one of the landowners down there, and we didn't want the development that was being proposed. So we jumped ahead of the, uh, that proposal and purchased it so we could control it. So all the actions the town has taken over the years that have been brought to town meeting for consideration and for approval are done in a deliberate manner to try right. and improve right. the town center. So when is the next Islington Task Force meeting? It's Wednesday night, February 15th at 7 p.m. at Two the Thurston nights. Middle School. And I ask because I think that we should decide how we want to handle this tonight so that the group is informed by not only our action, but whatever you're able to convey or Petruziello is able to convey on his own, or the, the Petruziello properties are able to convey to the group, because we have asked the task force to weigh in on the petitioner articles. Um, and I think that many different um, people may along the way weigh in on it, but I think what they have to say will be very important. So I think we should take some action here tonight. And I think uh, given the discussion, you know, I, I think that there is interest in, in pursuing the zoning freeze, albeit maybe not unified. So I'm willing to entertain a motion. I mean, like, do you want me to make a motion? Sounds yes. good. Okay. I just, my only question though, Nancy, is yes. the proposed action was to discuss. Are we still can't yeah. vote? Yeah. Okay. Um, that the Board of Selectmen um, vote to preserve an opportunity for future town meeting consideration of a mixed use redevelopment project in Islington Center by obtaining a zoning freeze pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 6, by filing a preliminary subdivision plan jointly with Petruziello Properties. Is there a second? I will second the motion, um, and we will take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, and uh, abstain? None. So that is how the Board of Selectmen will um, ask the town to proceed. And um, please convey to the task force the discussion we have had. Um, tonight so that they understand in general the the intent and that uh, this is again to protect the town's interests 
and uh, we'll see how the warrant articles that have been proposed by petitioners proceed and we'll look to your guidance on uh, timing of next steps. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, Nora. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are moving on to new business. We have a request. Oh, the ballot question. Do you want to stick around for that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think we already did the public works. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, the next item is a request for us to consider a placing a ballot question on the end of April town election ballot. And the background is that with the passage of the um, Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act, Chapter 334 of the Acts of 2016, legalizing the recreational use of marijuana, the Act also authorized cities and towns to limit or prohibit recreational marijuana facilities by ordinance or by law, if so approved by the voters of a city or, ta city or town. And so this is separate from having medical marijuana dispensaries. Locally, we had already prohibited any other Correct. marijuana related business. That's right. Now, in order to respond to the legislation that passed in November, we specifically need to go to the ballot if we want to prevent Right. marijuana retail operations in the community that's okay so that's what we have before us and I checked on how voting went in November and of the people who voted on this question in the town of Westwood approximately 58 percent of the voters did not support marijuana retail operations 42 percent said yes so we were not part of the vote in favor that ultimately um, prevailed so we are being asked at this point in time and we have until I, I think I calculated the beginning of March if it's 35 business days we have to get the ballot question approved by us before 35 I'll assume it's business days in advance of the town election. So, what else would you like to add? And then we can have a discussion. The only comment I'd add is that we tailored the language of the ballot question to make it clear to, or an attempt to make it clear to a voter that prohibiting the, uh, the allowance of a, a retail operation for mar a marijuana establishment would have no effect on the zoning that currently allows a registered marijuana dispensary from being approved in the ARO. So we want to make it clear to people that we still would allow an <coughs> opportunity to apply for a special permit for an RMD, a registered marijuana dispensary, which provides medicinal marijuana. What we're prohibiting here through the ballot question, or, or asking voters if they would like to prohibit, is non-medicinal marijuana, recreational sales mm. of marijuana and mar marijuana infused products. They're two different right. items treated by two different laws and we would, we would not be changing um, our let me product. Let me read what we have been provided as the question for the ballot. Shall this town prohibit the operation of all types of marijuana establishments as defined in Mass General Law Chapter 94G Section 1 including marijuana cultivators, marijuana testing facilities, marijuana product manufacturers, marijuana retailers, or any other type of licensed marijuana-related businesses within the town of Westwood, except for any registered marijuana dispensary which might be granted a special permit pursuant to Westwood Zoning Bylaw Section 7.4. So that exception at the end is what you're referring to. That's right. I want to make it clear to voters that Medicinal marijuana is still an acceptable item that could be given a special permit in Westwood. So. Will we be able to add any explanatory language with the ballot question like is sometimes done at the state yes, level? Yes, we accepted a statute a number of years ago. Yeah. Right. So we, could, yeah. we okay. could explain that a registered marijuana dispensary is the equivalent of 
medicinal and think, marijuana. And I think that's important because I believe the vote a few years back that predated our changing our zoning bylaw to allow the registered marijuana dispensary, I believe voters in Westwood were, the majority of voters were supportive. Yes, yes. Okay. Not, not an overwhelming, but, no, but it was a majority. significant majority. So I wouldn't want voters who were in favor of medicinal marijuana but opposed to recreational marijuana to misunderstand the ballot question we're asking. So that explanation will become very important. Um, but we don't have to decide on that narrative tonight. We right. can right. still. So, discussion? Anybody? No, I, I, anytime it goes in front of the voters, I think it's a good idea. So, leave it up to them. I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll take a motion to put the uh, language uh, as read. a question on the. Mike, would you like me to read it? Uh, you don't have to read it again. Uh, I already did. So, I think you can. I think you're good. We just need to ha have it placed on on the uh, election ballot. So, motion to do that. So, I move that we insert the um, previous um, language for the 2017 town election ballot pursuant to recreational marijuana. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. So, we are um, good to put that on the ballot. So, Tom, if I remember correctly, this the opportunity is there for someone to write on both sides, right? Of the that's the law we adopted that they can put an argument for and an argument against. Oh yes, yes, yeah. yes. In fact, we probably want to do that, right? Because the, the idea um, it has to be approved by the state, I believe, and has to be balanced. Yeah. Get a millennial to okay. write it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Nora. Thanks for Thank sticking you, Nora. around. Thank you, Nora. Okay, update on the public records law. So, Mike, I, um, this is something that affects all municipalities. I don't know how much you want to go into it, but we have new public records law that went into effect on January 1st, 2017, with a lot of details as uh, relates to this. Most importantly, that we now uh, designate a records access officer which i understand is our town clerk who then we can also or that per, i don't know how, how the process is but and designate I other designate, people i would designate other people in, probably in all the major uh, buildings in town so police fire uh Kyrie street probably could do dpw and uh, land use library so any other uh facility that would have records residing there, they would feed them through and meet the request through Dottie. So it's sort of a place to get the records up to Dottie, then that, that could be done. And uh, we have information linked on the primary page of our town website so people can know all the rules. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we don't need to go through those tonight uh, in any great length. Um, and I will say that there is a provision for populations under 20,000, which Westwood um, would fall under that, uh, that municipalities may assess a fee, including first two hours for time spent searching for, compiling, segregating, redacting, and reproducing a requested record. So there are a lot of provisions for what can be charged, um, how to, re the expanded ways one can request access to public records, et cetera, and that if people are interested in knowing those details, they can go on the uh, town website to get the information. And this, I think, has been in response in part to sometimes people have asked for public records and received extraordinary bills or quotes for the costs. So I think the state is trying to help make records more accessible to people who ask for them. I think that's exactly right. And, uh I think another important thing to note, this would be one of the things, uh, but it's one thing that I think. It, if you're appealed and you lose the case, uh, you're not only responsible for providing the records and the cost of doing so, but you're also subject to uh, having to cover the cost of the attorney okay. fees to, to fight the case. To A case you, being, being brought against you. So for not being responsive. Not oh. responsive that or that just we refused to, to provide uh, information that was being requested and then got appealed and they engaged an attorney to fight the case for them. 
um, you would be, if you were found to have to give over the records, ultimately, um, you also would have to pay their attorneys. And who would be the um, who would be the authority to decide whether or not we're compliant? Is that the AG's office? It's, uh, it's the AG's office, the yeah. supervisor of records. It's the AG's heavy hand of the right. Yes, it is, yes. Yeah. And that's a major change, because it kind of turns around a little bit. So, Mike, how many like of these requests would you say we get on average? Say a month, we get more than a dozen. Uh, no. Oh. no, I'd say we we get probably a couple, three a year. Okay, I mean it's not a major issue. Right. Not for and, us, and, but and, it is in some communities. Yeah, right, right. So we've never had a problem. With right, them. right. Saying no. No. We might cut back. We might. I have down. seen requests in other communities that are. Ex Extraordinary. I've made some of those requests. Well, it, can be, it can be used <laughs> abusively by yeah. individuals. Yeah. Used uh, for discovery. Right. For discovery yeah. or to... To or harass. To, to harass, to, to make the, make it difficult for the town it, it to can be, unfortunately, some, some people will abuse it. Right. Uh, but, but nonetheless, we, um, we want to be in compliance. <clears> and uh, I think it's important that people have access to know how to do it so um, this information is available online thank you okay Actually, by the way the website looks beautiful yeah <laughs> anything else Mike you want to mention on that no it was, uh, it was basically it okay thank you all right and our last regular agenda item no two more uh, next one East Street Bridge uh, we are being asked to sign a letter of consent for the use of eminent domain process by the MBTA for the acquisition of permanent and temporary easements to <coughs> expedite the process for replacement of the East Street Bridge. This is something we knew yeah. would be coming our way. Mm -hmm. um, and the work on the East Street Bridge, the design work proceeds, and the MBTA and its engineers are asking us to provide this approval and signing of uh, a letter that has been prepared so that they can proceed with the uh, eminent domain process. And uh, we've been given information on what the permanent and temporary easements are that they'll be seeking. And all of this is being done on town land. Well, no, so on, what you're correct. signing for is on Right, you know, right. Yes. We're, we're only, yes. We're only doing ours. Right. Eyes are the blue. Right. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. There are other actions the MBTA needs to take, but this discussion, what we're signing off Just on, for is town. only for Just town for land. Town. Correct. Okay. So basically, you will, that you will allow them to uh, use the eminent domain proceeding to take the easements that they need from the town. Mike, the only, the design piece that we had talked about last, when we were at the Downey School, I think it was you, Todd, and I, was we were going to request that the T on the on the new embankments instead of it just being plain concrete mm -hmm. see if we can somehow make that stone yes even if we had to contribute and, and I, you know we'll see it in the next iteration and that could we but comment? they were pretty confident that they were going to do yeah. something like that uh knowing that well, there was a lot of expression uh, right. that the aesthetics should be appropriate for the area especially since we're doing the well especially since they're going to remove those blocks right. which are are nice yeah. It just I don't want it to turn into just a concrete right. pillar. And you're able to participate in this? Sure. Okay. Um, any other discussion? Yeah. Motion? I move that we let me just go back here to my script. That we um, support and sign a letter to expedite the replacement of the East Street Bridge. Uh, which is scheduled for the proposed construction 2018. The Board of Selectmen moves and signs a letter addressed to Janelle Chan, Chief of Real Estate at the MBTA, indicating its consent for the use of eminent domain process for acquiring permanent and temporary easements on public property. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, none. Okay, now the last item on our agenda is a review of annual town meeting warrant articles. Okay, so we've got a little uh, updates on articles to remove from the warrant. Uh, first, there are three that pertain to um, Mass General Law Chapter 40. So the first one is Chapter 40U. 
on municipal fines. We had included an article that would allow for the establishment of procedures for assessment and collection of fines for violations of snow and ice removal, sanitation, and housing regulations. This, uh, we are told, is something that requires more study before being brought forward, so we're being asked to remove that article at this time. The next one, Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 58, a municipal charges lien for planning board fines and fees. Uh, it's been determined that the number of cases where this applies is too small to justify proceeding with the article. Next one, Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 58, again, municipal lien, charges lien, zoning, board fines and fees. On uh, this one, that again, the number of cases too small to justify proceeding. So in one case, more study time. In the second two cases, uh, not worth pursuing. So any discussion on these three? No. All right, I'll take a motion to remove those three from the warrant. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye, opposed none. Okay, next we have a revision to um, an article, again, Mass General Law Chapter 40, in this case, Section 21D, non-criminal disposition of ordinance, bylaw, rule, or regulation violations, and Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 21E, municipal charges and bills, due dates, and interest. Uh, what is being changed here, Mike? Well, we're taking, we already have D accepted, 21D, so we're just going for 21E, which would be, you know, which would allow us to establish a due date that these fines are required to be paid, which is a uh, prerequisite that somebody has not paid the bill by a specific due date, and that allows it to then be able to be um, added as a lien on the property tax. We're not accepting the statute. We're amending the bylaws. Yeah. I, so what what we had listed before was both 21D and uh, 21E, and we didn't need the 21D part. Is that what we're changing? We're removing no. that and piece from what we drafted? Thomas talking about we're just, instead of adopting 21E, we're simply adopting a bylaw which allows the town to establish a due date and interest rate to be paid on Fine. Okay, so we're just amending the title. Um, any discussion? No. I'm good. Okay, motion? Uh, I move that we accept the change in language for uh, the article per per pertaining to Chapter 40, Section 21D. E. E. I'm sorry, 21E. Thank Second. you. Second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed, none. And then we have an explanation of remaining articles. So this is uh, defense of continuing with three articles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do we have information uh, regarding recent history for each of these departments and what has been um, the volume of activities well, because people will be asking us that, that write tickets i'll get the actual volumes we're uh, compiling now mm -hmm. um, the other aspect of it that um, was brought up by the finance commission when we, we appeared before them is how does this become a lien that is an uncomfortability about becoming a lien currently these uh, these three uh Fines and fee fines that uh, get um, issued for non-compliance are appealable to to me. The hearing, which is a designated hearing officer, as a town administrator, um, for any contested fees. There's no ability to lean because we haven't adopted that portion of the law. Um, what we're proposing is that a three-member review panel consisting of the chairman of the board of selectmen chairman of the Assess Board of Assessors and the treasurer um, would serve as a panel. So if we decided that these fees have remained outstanding, they've not been paid, they've either not been appealed or that I've decided in favor of the town continuing to issue and uh, seek to collect the fine for the violation, the only way it would get 
into a lien onto the property tax bill would be if the three members, the majority of the three members, would vote to say yes. That should go forward as a lien. In other words, we would have to justify, the department and me would have to justify um, why that fine should be allowed to go forward and, and be leaned against the property so we could get it collected. If the panel decided not to, then it would simply remain an outstanding bill that the town would seek to collect without being able to lean the property. So would you say another administrative layer? It'd be another administrative uh, layer. Basically an in-house appeal to right. yeah. a, a group. Yeah, a but, group. you know, it would remove... Right, yeah. Right, there was right. some question as to whether or not, you know, I could be... Impartial, and yeah, I, right. I, I get it, yeah. I understand yeah. that. When a department head uh, takes an action, can I be objective to, to challenge my department head? Uh, that's a legitimate yeah. question to be asked. And this would remove it from that. This would yeah. put it into a three-panel uh, uh, issue to make the, make the decision. And to force the department head and, and the town administrator to justify why I think it should continue to go forward. There are instances yeah. where I'd, I'd say that you know that, that it's it is actually legitimate, but without such a threat, there's no ability. Right. This is similar to a. I would liken it to a parking ticket that you get out there. If you refuse to pay your parking ticket and to appeal your parking ticket, um, or even lose an appeal and refuse to pay, ultimately the parking ticket gets submitted to the registry of motor vehicles mm -hmm. and right. you don't get your license or you don't get your registration next time you want until you come back and satisfy the bill that you owe to the town and it's kind of the same theory mm -hmm. and ultimately what we want is compliance with the regulation yeah. I, we I, don't I, want to be issuing I, fines I can tell you that mm -hmm. in my negotiations <laughs> with people oftentimes what i seek is you were given an order to do something and you didn't do it go do it and I'll leave you with the burden of the... Yeah. It's yeah. not... It's a compliance. I'm, yeah. We're all chasing after. It's not yep. the fine. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. No, no, no other action we need to take, though, no. right? No. Yeah, we already no. did. No. Okay. Um, but I do want, and I've said this before, no, Jeff to come in next meeting okay. to talk to us about the no. uh, marijuana no. article on public land, alcohol consumption, no. and marijuana... Recreational marijuana. Oh, I didn't know that. Marijuana. Okay. Well, we want him in to explain to us what is being sought before we go before the Finance Commission and a public hearing. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, okay. All right. Back to minutes. Okay. So, Christine, you updated the January 9th minutes. Thank you. Any? No. Nope. Questions on those? Oh. All right. Motion. I move that we approve the January 9th, 2017 uh, Board of Selectmen minutes consisting of eight pages. Second. All <laughs> in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, none. All right. And then we have the January 24th. Wait a minute. I skipped over. Do I have January 24th? At the back. There's only three pages at the back. Oh, hidden. Huh. That was a little short All meeting right. we had. January 24th minutes. Yes, it was a short meeting. Um, okay. I, I move that we approve the minutes as written for the January 24th, 2017. What a select the meeting consisting of three pages. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, none. All right, we are not going into executive session. Our next meeting is on Monday, February 27th at 7.30 p.m. here in the Selectman's meeting room at Town Hall. Um, anything else? Any other business? The only, the only thing, I don't know if we can, I, I need to talk about the March 6th date, I'm not here. So March 6th is the before FinCom. I think we've just held that in case we need to do anything. So okay. yeah. and try to a, avoid. We had a meeting a week before. So okay, okay. I think we'll Probably not we'll need it. Maybe just to talk before we go into About the, the public hearing. Coming up at the public hearing. 
Yeah. Oh, the February 27th. Okay, you're right. Yeah. You're right, uh, right it's right. 6, so right. we right. might right. talk right before the meeting. Right. Okay. Um, Fine, I just wanted you to be aware of that. Okay, thank you. All right, any other business? Okay, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those none. Okay, thank you. Thank you.